Welcome in, everybody, to Grind Time, powered by Full-Time Fantasy and the FFWC. I am joined tonight by Nelson. You can't see him, but you can hear him. He's like the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. But he is here. He's with me. He had some technical difficulties with his camera, but fear, never fear, Nelson is here. Nelson, how you doing, buddy? Good. How you doing, Billy? I'm doing great. Thanks for joining me, taking the time. I know, I know you're getting back from, was it a wrestling match? Is that what it was? Yeah, wrestling meet. Yep. Nice. How'd he do? Uh, we, we got our butts kicked. Um, <laughs> the, the whole, you know, the whole wrestling team, we, we faced a powerhouse. So awesome. Well, awesome that you get to go and watch your, your, your son wrestle. It's, I can't wait till my kids are old enough to do sports and, um, you know, sorry to hear they got their butt kicks, but Hey, they are going to learn something from it. Right. It, yep. you never, you get better whenever you're facing people who are better than you, just like fantasy. Right. So, Players are looking to get better. I'm always looking to get better. You're always looking to get better. Everybody's always looking to improve their their chances of winning. They're looking at uh, ways to become more profitable. Hence why people are watching this show tonight, to learn from one of the best, yourself, um, Nelson here. And um, you've had a lot of success in the high stakes industry. Uh, I know you have, I think it was a little over a million dollars in career earnings in fantasy football. Is that right? Yes, sir. Man, so I mean, just for 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 those of you who are jumping into high stakes, like I know that seems just like the, that. That's just such an like an astronomical number and such an amazing feat. Um, and even myself, you know, who I would consider myself as a veteran high stakes player, I I'm not even close to a million dollars, right? I I'm getting like in the high 100s now, but like that is just such an accomplishment. I want to say hats off to you. One of the reasons I wanted to have you on the show, your high stakes success. Um, but most importantly, we shared a lot of teams um, last last year together. I think we had what we have six or five or whatever it was, um, and you drafted them and I managed them in season. Um, so there was a few things that I'd say a common denominator when we looked at those teams. And it was for me identifying it after you had drafted was Nelson was very good at identifying talent. And I kind of wanted to start with that. What does your process entail? How are you identifying talent? How are you doing your player evaluations? What are you looking for? Like walk me through the beginning kind of off season process for Nelson. And what does that entail in terms of identifying targets going into drafts? Well, I mean, that that's a loaded question. Are, are we talking, are we talking like rookies, like identifying rookies? Are we talking about let's, identifying let's, players in the NFL today? What, you know, it okay, yeah. Let me let me clarify. Let's start with rookies because that's what we're all doing primarily right now. We're we're looking at we're looking at rookie situations and how it's going to affect the veterans. So walk me through your process. Are you are you looking at rookies first? I'm assuming you are. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So and and what does that entail? So I, I really, you know, I'll I'll definitely watch a little bit of college football during the season, um, but I'm just so busy with you know, regular fantasy football and, and everything that, you know, Saturdays just become pretty tough uh, to catch all the games. So like my real process starts right around now. I usually take a break um, from football in general. You know, I still watch the, you know, the NFL playoffs and, and things like that. But I, I kind of just take a break from like evaluating or feel like, um you know, I'm just enjoying the games. Like I, but at the same time, you know, it, it, it never goes away where you're you're always analyzing, okay, what, what's the offense doing, what's the defense doing? But um right about now is where I'm I'm going through and looking at, you know, uh prior year games. I'm looking at players that maybe are slipping under the radar, uh, that maybe didn't play a full season this year, and I'm looking back at previous years, uh looking at highlights. Um, the scouting combine, uh, is always, uh, of interest to me. Um, I'm, I'm not always, like, it, it, I'm not super focused on like, oh, the, you know, the 40 yard dash or whatever, but Hand I'm, size. I'm, yeah, I, I mean the typical one obviously is the 40 yard dash, but for me, it's more of like, I'm looking for like the, the shuttle, the, the cone drill, broad jump, you know, things like that. So like an accumulation of that. I'm watching, you know, the receivers and running backs when they're running their uh, passing drills and and everything, <clears throat> and then um, I just go through and just kind of compile like you know a scouting report 
of players that stuck out to me. And then at that point is where I'll compare it to other people's work and just so I don't bias myself. So, and then I'll look at it and see if, you know, am I way off on a player? You know, like I, I rank this player, you know, higher than, you know, everybody else The you know, this play, player X is off everybody's radar and then, and vice versa, you know, where I, I've got a player that I'm really low on that I didn't care for. And a lot of people are, are high on that particular player. So yeah, it's not, it's not on the show sheet, but can you give me an example? Just, just kind of prompted the question would be, can you give me a question of, somebody that you said, wow, you know, their, their three cone drill, their agility looks great. Their broad jump looks good. They look athletic. I, I liked their tape, um, but was down on people's rankings. Can you give me a player that comes to mind? It doesn't have to be last year. It can be in a year. Yeah. I mean, last year was even, you know, tricky because I, I, I only had like pro days to go off of and it just yeah. seemed like everybody's pro day was like off the charts, you know? So it, it, it just felt like the numbers were skewed a, a little Inflated. bit. Inflated. Yeah, yeah. It, everyone ran a four three forty, you know, or you know, ridiculous numbers. But I'd probably say, you know, a player that I think in general people were like flew under the radar that I was high on. And I, I mean, I can go back and look at my drafts back in, in May and June, and you'll see that I drafted him. So it's not just, you know. Um, oh, you know, I liked them, but you know, didn't draft them. I, I actually took him in drafts, uh, was Elijah Mitchell. So he was a guy that I was high on and I, I felt like that, you know, that's part of player evaluation. So I don't want to get into the other part of it as far as like his, you know, draft situation and, you know, landing with the 49ers. Cause that, that kind of skews things, but just, just from a pure talent standpoint and what I saw of him, I thought that, you know, he was more talented than what he was probably getting credit for uh, in general from the, the general, you know, uh, dynasty and, and, you know, draft experts population. And so you had touched base on the team part of it again uh, me kind of just asking questions based upon your answers here and and um we at what point do you elevate or i should say you know tick down your rankings or or, or or you know move them down your rankings based upon landing spot i mean prime example that i can think about were for me a couple of years ago was Clyde edwards alaire versus jonathan taylor right jonathan taylor was the um the the most talented back in that in that uh draft class but when we all saw Clyde edwards Hilaire go to the Chiefs at what at what point are you saying hey I'm going to move this player up my rankings based upon landing spot and they may not be the most talented piece but the landing spot is going to help kind of move that needle is there a mark for you or are you just purely going talent here no no no. so definitely so uh, my evaluation first you know, starts with the talent piece and then landing spot is huge, uh, for fantasy. So I can like a player, you know, as, as much as anyone, but if they land in a tough spot, whether it's the depth chart or whether I think that, you know, the scheme, uh, you know, playing time, things like that, um, is, is going to end up hurting or elevating that player, you know, that changes my opinion. Uh, on that player also. So like Elijah Mitchell, I thought their run scheme uh, fit his, t uh, his skill set uh, pretty well. And I thought that although the backfield looked muddy uh, because I mean, you, you had Trey Sermon who was drafted higher than him. So there, there was that. Um, yeah. And then you had Mostert coming in, but I, I felt like Mitchell I mean, I didn't think like, okay, Mostert's going to get hurt. Sermon's going to fall flat on his face. Shanahan's going to hate him. And Mitchell's going to be the guy all year. I mean, I didn't think that, but I definitely thought that, you know, if I drafted him, I, I definitely, you know, that early on, I felt like he could possibly earn a, you know, some type of role and injuries do happen. So, 
it was, you know, I was taking him in the 19th, 20th round yeah. of redraft. And it was just, you know, a flyer, just taking a shot on a guy. Um, yeah, I looked back at some of my drafts and had him and then dropped him, of course, like week one, because you're taking, you know, speculation. He wasn't a thing yet. And then within a week, here we go. He's number one waiver wire. Right. And yeah. Um, I mean, it happens. It happens to us all. And I, I was similar instance with Mitchell. I just liked the talent, but thought everything had to go wrong in order for his scenario to go right. Right. Yeah. And, and it, it beautiful, perfect storm. And it happened. Right. It and, yeah. and, and here we are with, you know, Elijah Mitchell now sneaking into fourth round drafts already here in, in early 2022. Um, so, rookies okay i understand the scenario um landing spots like, like Ky kylan hill was another guy that it didn't work out but like talent wise i i thought he was another guy that was like kind of under the radar um but very talented went to a bad situation you know they already had dylan and jones there and yeah. i just didn't see a way for him to carve out a role a clear path right and yeah yeah, I think that that's uh, a major factor as well. So you you do your rookie evaluations. We start getting into the, the the draft. The draft pops up. Here we go. We know the landing spots. We adjust up or down based upon landing spots. Now I'm assuming at this point, this is when you start really kind of honing into um, free agents. Walk me through now that process. How are you evaluating? How does free agency affect your valuation? How does camp? The whole shebang. Sure. So with free agents, you know, usually with uh, free agent wide receivers, um, it it's a uh, two things. It, it's one, where do they sign? Who do they sign with? And what is their draft capital in, in fantasy drafts? So, you know, are, are they going in their early, f you know, first few rounds? Are they, you know, a 10th round pick? So that makes a difference. So, for example, you know, one of my, uh, so I, I try to stick to a process. So I have a process and I try to stick to it. Um, you're going to be right. Some, sometimes you're going to be wrong sometimes, but I, I believe that, you know, process over results is, is, is the way to go long-term. And part of my process is that, you know, free agent wide receivers in their first year for whatever reason, and it, it could be, you know, just picking up the offense, the chemistry with the quarterback or lack thereof, um, they tend not to do well that their first year. Last year, I faded Stefan Diggs and DeAndre Hopkins because they got traded to brand new teams. And um, we, it, again, a wide receiver in in the first year of of an offense, they tend to underwhelm or or not perform as well. And they were, I mean, Diggs maybe not, not so much. He was uh, two years ago. I think he was like a six round pick maybe yeah. um, at that time when he went to Buffalo. And but Hopkins was like, I think a, like a second. He was like locked in second round pick. He was. And, I just left those guys alone and obviously they, they proved me wrong, but I mean, there's been plenty of guys, you know, through the years that have signed, you know, whether as free agents or got traded and their first year in that offense, they just, they don't do well. Uh, so that's part of w one of my processes for wide receivers. Okay. Um, how does that, so how does, um, so how does it affect running backs? Are you same thing as the offensive line? Is it uh, um, chemistry with, you know, the handoff no, run, the line? Yeah. Running backs don't matter. R <laughs> running backs. It, it, it's, volume based. <laughs> yeah. R running backs. It, it's all about, um, they, they can come in and hit the ground running. I, I think wide receiver. Literally. It, it, it's, it's different. You, you gotta have, you gotta have chemistry with the quarterback you got to, the terminology on offense and the playbook is, um, is a lot more intense than what, what you got to learn as a running back in, in real football. So, um, yeah, the, that doesn't apply to, to the running back situation. That's just purely landing spot. You know, how, how bad did the team opportunity share opportunity, you know, how bad did the team want that, you know, that player, uh, you know, things like that. Abe here who won um, 
the FFWC this year says Kenny Galladay struggled. Yes. Uh, another example of what Nelson was talking about, free agency signing with a new team, new chemistry. So I like it. I also faded um, Diggs. I, I went back and was like re-listening to some of the things I said on podcast and was like, holy crap, I was way wrong. But it was, you know, again, process over results, right? I yep. was on DeAndre Hopkins, but not quite to the level that he was being drafted at. So he was faded on my list as well. I just wasn't willing to to risk that second round draft capital on him when he was going to a new offense, when he had, you know, a new system, a new coach, the whole shebang, right? And I agree with you on those. I'm looking at wide receivers in those as well. Um, I like your sentiment. It doesn't matter. Running backs can hit the ground running. I didn't have this queued up in time, but it was right. The no pun intended, but uh, um, I agree. They can just get in. Like you look at like prime example, and I'm not saying this is a player evaluation, but running backs hitting the ground running. I mean, Seattle signed, crusty ass adrian peterson off the street and next thing you know he's running for the team in between the tackles and a goal line so i agree on on that as well um okay so we have our free agents now um at, you're getting news throughout the off season um how often are you updating your draft sheets are you do you are you creating your own rankings here are you are you just making tiers how does how is your What's your draft process entail and and how are you creating your, I guess, draft list? Sure. So it, it's a little bit of, it, it's a, a mixture um, of my own uh, personal rankings, you know, whether I I really like a player and, and I'm high on them this year. Uh, players that I'm fading are, you know, tend to be you're ranked a little bit lower than other guys, than the consensus um, that, you know, projections and rankings that are out there. And then, uh, you know, I start drafting pretty early and it, it's ADP. So I, I kind of mix that in also. And that, that kind of keeps my, you know, I feel like my rankings kind of keeps everything in line. Like you're, you're going to find like in my rankings last year, um, you know, I had Austin Eckler pretty high, uh, up in the rankings. So if you looked at it, I want to say, and I, I apologize, but I'm I'm in off season mode uh, still. But I, I want to say I had him like number three ranked. Um, I'd probably say that most most sites, fantasy websites out there, didn't have Eckler as a top three ranked running back. No. Um, so like that would be a that would be like an example. Uh, obviously that worked out, but like <clears throat> I'll give you an example of like I had Antonio Gibson ranked you know high up there also. Uh, so he was like, I want to say like top six, top seven ranked running back for me. And, and you look so, at what you did on the stretch and that's what we had thought his ceiling was going to be. Right. Yeah. But, if McKissick is out of the equation, which he was, about it. yeah, it, he has the talent to do that. Um, but obviously, you know, I, I still missed on that. That was ended up being a, a bad pick, but um, that would be like an example of, you know, I have guys highly ranked, um, but I take into consideration ADP a little bit, um, and I'll make adjustments too. Like, I, I don't need to, I don't need to like rank someone to get clicks or or to have people, you know, for me to say like, "Hey, look at me! I, you know, I want attention because I have this player ranked number one overall, and nobody else does." Like, I don't. I don't care so much about that. It, I care more about just being right uh, on the player and making and, money and making money. Yeah. Um, and then the other part is that if I find that, okay, I, I really like this player, but his ADP, like if I let him go, let's say I have a top five pick and I'm going to say, you know, you know what, uh, this year I'm really high on cam acres. Okay. Uh, for example, and I have a top five pick and I just keep hammering cam Akers with a top five pick. But if I let him go, he goes to the one, two turn, right? He, he gets, he goes somewhere late first round, early second round. Well, I'm just an idiot at that point in my process of not allowing him to go at ADP and acquire him with different player builds for example, rather than pushing him up every single time in a draft. So I'll take a step back a after a few drafts and say, hey, I'm higher on this guy than everybody else. 
And I don't need to be taking him at this spot every single time. Let's mix in some other guys. Yeah. Yep. For yeah, sure. Just like stocks are, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to look in and make and say, hey, I can't have 70, 80% of Cam Akers. I, I might be able to get him on the way back and I might be able to get a Henry and Aker stack, right? Or yeah. or something along those lines. So I, I agree as well. Um, I was also very high on Eckler um, last year. Mm -hmm. I did a, a Sports Illustrated draft and was called out on it actually because I took him number three overall, and it, and okay. I remember th I remember the sentiment was uh, biggest question mark of round one Austin Eckler being drafted at number three, <laughs> uh -huh. and and I, I I'm the same way if I have somebody high in my rankings I do my own projections right I have my own thirty two I do all thirty two teams every every pass attempt every completion every touchdown you know. The, uh, accuracy, the whole, the whole shebang carries catches yards, touchdowns. Right. And I do it unbiased. I do it blind. And I say, what is my first opinion of this offense? What is my first um, vision that this offense is going to work out? Right. Did they sign someone to the offensive line? Do they beef up the offense line chargers, for instance, last year. Right. And, and, and we take a look at those and then I do my non-biased rankings. I agree with you. I also like to compare them to some of the, um, you know, peers in the industry to say, did I miss something? Am I way off on something? Wh why am I way off on something? Right. And if sometimes I like my reason, right? Like Debo, like Scott says Debo over here. And that was one of my processes. I said, Debo, for instance, I just loved his yards after the catch. I was watching film 2019 NFC championship game. He was a beast, got hurt in 2020 negative, negative connotation of his name. Everyone was overdrafting Ayuk who I was fading because of that reason. It was just thought he was being overdrafted. But I think as long as you have that process, right, is what I'm trying to say. I'm, gonna, I'm getting off on a tangent here. But I want to just say as long as you have that process and you're able to identify it, that's what's going to make people better players. So fully agree with you there as well. Um, so you you mentioned your, your draft sheet. How often are you updating this? Are you doing it weekly? Are you kind of taking more information in and saying, hey, I'm going to let this ADP settle for the next few weeks and adjust again? Or are you just kind of um, kind of live on the fly as players are being drafted every day? I would say it's it's every few days to a week uh, that I'm I'm updating it. I, I just there's, you know, news chain, you know, injuries change things like. You know, perfect example. You're <clears throat> you're drafting along and and having a good time in the summer, and then Cam Akers blows his Achilles, and yep. all of a sudden, you got to quickly adjust. And it's okay. You got Darrell Henderson here. Um, what's going on with this situation? Is he going to be the guy? Uh, I don't trust him. Do I or do I trust him? Um, okay, who's next in line? Because Henderson, you know, he seems to tend to get banged up, you know. So now we're looking at, you know, Jake Funk and, you know, okay, Sony got traded to the Rams. So, okay, how do we evaluate this now? Uh, do we draft Sony ahead of Henderson? Do we keep drafting Henderson? Do, do we got to drop Henderson? So it's all those questions that, you know, you, you have to be able to adjust on the fly. You can't just leave, <clears throat> you know, obviously I, I do, um, I do work, you know, with FTN and, you know, I have subscribers and they're doing drafts and, you know, I need to be able to adjust. I can't just say like, oh yeah, just leave everything as usual. N 100%. No, you know, things changed, like the market changed and player evaluations changed and, <clears throat> You know, I have to be able to, you know, figure out and, and determine what I think of that backfield now and and what adjustments need to be made. So, yeah, you know, it's it's constant. It's it's dynamic. It's not static. We have a listener question here from Anna Jimenez. She's a, a high state player as as well as a, a friend of the show um, and see her all over the place. Um, and I'm not sure if there's an answer here, but I'm going to let you answer this one. On average, how many processes need to be in place in order to be effective at cashing at fantasy? How many processes need to be in place? I I don't even know if there's a select number of processes. I, I think my, you, my, just my need to, you just need to follow a process is is how I look at it. And I, I think you also need to be open-minded to be able to tweak and adjust your process. But what you can't do, I, I think where people fail is you, you can't, like, for example, my example of 
you know, fading wide receivers first year in their offense. If, if I just took Diggs and Hopkins like last year where they, uh, they got me good, you know, I faded them and they were absolutely terrific. And I had none of them on, on my teams that, that hurt. I can't go into the off season and say, okay, the process didn't work and okay, the process is now gone and I'm going back to drafting, you know, any receiver. I'm going to draft Kenny De- Galladay uh, this year um, because my process obviously didn't work last year. So you get, you kind of, where people feel is you, you got to stick to that process. You just kind of have to evaluate and say small sample size there. There's definitely a bigger sample size and, you know, I, I have a bunch of, names that I can't think of right now um, that, you know, of like players that signed in their first year with teams, but like, you know, uh, Odell Beckham Jr., you know, his first year in Cleveland, everyone was really high on him and, you know, he's, he's going to be great there and it didn't work out. And I want to say even Allen Robinson um, had a decent year, but his first year in Chicago uh, wasn't all that great. Um, Amari Cooper, uh, when he got traded to the Cowboys, I want to say that, you know, his first year, that wasn't all that great. You know, there, there's a, there's a bunch of guys that, you know, you can look back and, and say, oh yeah, you, you know what? Like, uh, Corey Davis on the jets, although like no one fucking worked on the jets. It, it didn't matter who you were. Michael but, uh, Carter is pretty productive down, down, the, yeah. down the line. But that's a running uh, back. We're talking about wide <laughs> receivers. That's, that's true. That's true. Uh, Marvin <laughs> Jones, you know, had a couple of, you know, he had a couple of games, a couple of highlight games. But in general, you know, it wasn't a very good year for him. This year, I'm all in on Marvin Jones where he's going to go in drafts. So I would be buying him. But last year, he was a fade. So it, it's – I. I to try to answer that question, it's, you know, you just have to have a process. I think it's, you know, trying to learn from those things of like what worked, but you got to have kind of like a history of it, you know, like an, another part of my, my process on fading players is uh, I mentioned, you know, early on the show, I loved Elijah Mitchell. I loved his uh, college tape. Um, I love them so much this year that when he became available and most year went down, I, I spent up, uh, to get him that week in, on teams where I was weak at running back, uh, how whether, much, how much were you spending 80, 90%? I, I was, I was in the 70%. Like I had all my fab, you know, it was week one and I was probably in the six to high seven hundreds range, but it was it was team specific. It wasn't like I didn't do it like across the board, every team, you know, if, if I had, you know, Indeed. yeah. If, if I had a Austin Eckler, you know, uh, uh, Joe Mixon team, you know, or Najee Harris, like I, I wasn't going to be going after Elijah Mitchell, but you know, on, on the teams where I drafted, you know, one run RB one and, and just punted RB two. Yeah. The, a lot of those teams, it, it made sense that that's Trey, Trey Sermon teams. <laughs> yeah. Trey Sermon teams. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, he's an example of, he was a free, free agent pickup, right? This year. Yep. Okay. And he's or if you were lucky enough to keep him through week one from drafting him. It, yes, exactly. Um, this year in drafts, I guarantee you that, He's going to live like in the top four rounds, I, I think. I'm seeing him go pretty frequently already between four and five right now. Okay. So that's one of my rules is that when a, a player was a free agent pickup, a waiver wire pickup the year prior, and they go in the top four rounds, you fade them. You leave them alone. Because, yeah, Elijah Mitchell made sense for me to spend $700 on on specific teams and help me this season and he did but you can't be you you can't be biased and and you got to be able to you know you you have your favorites and you've got 
guys that you absolutely hate and you'll never draft them. You, you can't do that year to year. It's a new year and you have to be able to adjust. So Elijah Mitchell is going to be a guy that I'm going to fade uh, this year because I go ahead. No, I was going to say, you already answered my next question was the fade list. So you, we've touched base on that, but do you have, so there's a fade list and then I consider a, a no draft list, right? Like regardless of how far they fall in ADP, I will not touch this player. Do you have a no, a no go draft list or, or is it just a fade? And if they be, present as a value, you will take them. Yeah, correct. Um, I mean, I have my fade list that, that I follow, but there there's been times like this past uh, summer draft season where I had a, a guy on the fade list, but he started dropping in, in drafts where I was like, okay, he's a fade for me, but like, I don't need to be like so stubborn here to not draft this guy where now he's kind of presenting himself as a little bit of a value or where you, you draft the guy. And even if he busts, like it's not going to crush my team. So now I'm, I'm kind of interested. So I will adjust during the draft season. If, if uh, a player's uh, draft stock falls. So everyone's on the table as long as there's a, like a, a cost base analysis, right? And we're analyzing that and we're saying he, at some point, this cost presents a value to my team and he's going to outperform this cost. And if not my initial, my initial, um, you know, draft capital that I invested in this player is not significant enough to really hurt my team. Yeah. It, m my process of compiling that fade list is like a blend of, of a few things like, okay, a little bit of talent evaluation. It has a lot to do with coaching. Um, and who the, the coaches are and what the scheme is. Um, it has a lot to do with, you know, depth chart and, and the situation that that player is in. So like, I'll give you another example, like miles Gaskin, uh, last year, you know, I think he was drafted in the top five rounds for the most part, right? In the beginning. Yes. In, right. So, um, I want to say like fifth round. He 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 snuck into like the sixth round in some drafts, but like he was a guy that I had on the fade list, and I just knowing the Miami situation and that coaching staff and how they use their running backs, I felt like he was a he was Elijah Mitchell. So for for me, the year prior, free agent pickup helped a lot of teams get to their championship, helped people win win leagues, Miles Gaskin ended up being a, a great pickup that year, right? For yep. what, what he cost and what he was able to produce. But it, I still didn't like that situation um, in Miami. So for where he was going, I felt like he was overvalued. Okay. So, I love it all. Agree with it all as well. Um, it's funny. Our brains think a lot alike here, Nelson. And I, I, um, I, I was looking at too. So a couple of questions I want to talk about with player valuation, fade lists, you know, value. Um, does that change for you in confined leagues? Is, are you adjusting that process versus a tournament tournament? We're shooting for upside. Um, how much is that changing for you in a tournament? And then does it change for you in best ball? Um, in terms of like the actual fade list, my like fading players. No, that, that doesn't change. The only thing that would change, like, in a best ball tournament, I guess, or, I guess or, the player valuation, like is what I mean. So, like if you, like if somebody is on, like you love them, like you love, um, like for instance, like say that you love, um, you love Cam Akers, right? You mentioned him earlier. You're you're going to be taking him top five picks. You're going to start letting him slip if you take too much of him. You're going to let him come back around the turn, right? Now, is that process going to change for you in a confined league right of course you don't have to worry about ownership because it's a confined league is that so what i'm saying is is that where you're saying hey if this guy is on my must draft list i'm taking him every time no matter what in this round or how does that change how you're approaching a confined league versus a tournament draft in a confined league i i look at it as you know most confined leagues that i'm in are high dollar ones you know 20k 10k yeah you know 5k uh, leagues, those I'm, I'm drafting them and, and just, I'm not, 
not necessarily looking at player ownership and percentage wise and, and things like that. I'm just looking at it as, you know, what player do I like here at this spot? What player makes sense for the way I constructed the team? Um, and I just look at it that way. I, you know, a fade is still a fade for me. Um, but like, I'm, I'm looking to take the players that I'm really high on. Um, so I'm probably a, a bit more aggressive in, in confined leagues, I would, I would say. And then, uh, structure matters. Whereas like in a tournament setting, um, I don't, I don't mind building like a zero running back team, uh, for example, um, in, in a confined league, I'm probably looking at, you know, team construction and trying to be a little more balanced coming out of the game. I love it. That you're like, I swear you're, you're going off our notes here because you're at, you're answering questions that I'm going to be prompting for next. So, um, now, now I'm just stalling because I'm looking down my list at my next few questions. Um, (laughs) If, if if a player if a player starts skyrocketing up boards, so a player that comes to mind last last year was Odell Beckham. Okay, he was going in like round seven, eight, and sometimes okay, even better, Antonio Brown. Okay, either insert player name here, and 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 it it applies, right? They're going mm-hmm. later in drafts. They start climbing up boards. They're going from nine to eight to seven to six, right? At what point do you say I'm no longer going to draft this player, even if you are high on them? And you're saying, and then what are the reasons why? I mean, I know my reasons, but I want to hear your reasons. Um, if I like a player enough, I, I'll chase them a little bit up the draft board. But I, I think, like, uh, Antonio Brown's a good example. So uh, I was very high on Antonio Brown. I, I had um, I, I had a really high percentage uh of Antonio Brown on teams. And it was and looking great the first quarter of the year. <laughs> got a, Listen, it got my teams out of the gate fast. Um, Absolutely. So it, it, it worked out. I, I look at it as for where I drafted him in, in early drafts, like ninth, eighth round. And then he's kind of settled in like in the sixth round, seventh round range. Um, to me, like what he was able to do, like I, I was fine with it. It, it sucked that he got injured and, and he missed all that time. Um, but like that was all pre Thursday night game. And then the Thursday night game came and Antonio Brown now is a third round pick. Absolutely. And I want to say a lot of my main events, a lot of the confined leagues that were after the Thursday night game, right before the season started, um, I found myself not drafting him. Like, you know, once I saw like, okay, He's settling in in the third round. It's like, all right, I've got enough Antonio Brown. I've got I'm enough, out. you know. Yeah, I'm out. So, like, that would be an example of, of you know, getting off of a player. Um, but I'll give you an, a poor example of, you know, uh, of like uh, Amari Cooper and you know, getting on a player and CD Lamb and drafting them higher than what they were going and what I, where I was drafting them because of that Thursday night game and it re- that didn't work out, you know, see lamb and Amari Cooper ended up having mediocre uh, seasons uh, for where they went after the Thursday night game. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and, and everyone listening, like one of the, one of the best in the business here, Nelson is, you know, not shy of saying that, you'll make those errors because that's how you get better as a player. You identify, you made an error and you correct, right. And you adjust the process. Um, so I think, you know, it takes a lot for someone to come out and say, I made an error, but you know what? The process was still right. And I, I, I learned from the situation, right? So, um, last few questions here. I know we're, we're nearing, we're nearing towards the tail end of the podcast. So I wanted to walk you through, um, Give me three players that you are targeting heading into 2022 and three players that you are planning to fade. Um, I know it's early, so it doesn't need to be, um, rookie specific right now. If you, if you have rookies in mind, great. But if just kind of early drafts, I know we're in a draft together right now, but if, if there are any players that are on side, your fade list as of right now, and any players that are on your, um, that you're targeting right now. Sure. Um, players that probably come to mind that I'm going to be interested in like early rounds, uh, acres, 
DeAndre Swift, uh, Antonio Gibson, depending on what they what they do there, uh, if they re-sign McKissick or not, um, he would be a player of interest. Um, like rookies, I'd probably say that like Traylon Burks, depending on landing spot, I'm really high on him. Um, I think he's the best wide receiver uh, coming out of the draft. Um, actually, I think he's like he's like a cross between like DK Metcalf and Debo Samuel uh, to me. Um, guys, I'm fading. Uh, what is it? Say it again. You get me excited. You just I, I get you excited you Debo. Yeah, when I say Debo. I I know. I know. <laughs> I, I know how to. I know how to get to your heart. <laughs> um, guys, I'm fading. Um, th- there's going to be a bunch of them. I'm not going to be interested in Derrick Henry uh, this year. Um, Alvin Kamara with Sean Payton gone and that whole offense. Uh, probably not going to be interested in him. Uh, Elijah Mitchell, uh, Amonra St. Brown. I'm not going to be interested in, and even though like I, he's another kid like high on him, but I think he's going to get a little bit overdrafted, uh, this year. So real quick, we were in a draft. I took a player and I had this player in mind. I thought you were going to mention him. You didn't mention him yet. Clyde edwards Alaire. I took him in the four or five turn. I think it was four 11. Mm-hmm. He didn't like the pick. Why is Clyde Edwards-Alaire on not necessarily your fade list, but why did you not like the pick in the fourth, fifth round? What what to you prompts that not being a value? It, it's not. It's really not because of him burning me this year because I was high on Clyde Edwards-Alaire uh, going into the season, so I was wrong on him. Um, and the reason why I'm not high on the pick is like it. It just looks like to me that. Kansas City is not interested in using him as a bell cow. Number one, they look like they're they're okay mixing in um, different running backs, and to me, he didn't look as good as he did his rookie year. Uh, so this season, I know he battled, you could know, be injury base could could be injury base, but like he just didn't look as explosive to me um, this year. So he, he's a guy, I mean, fourth, fifth round, right, right in that area where you took him, it's not, it's not the end of the world. Like you're, you're taking him technically compared to this year, you're taking him as a value. So 100%. Um, I'm, I'm okay with the pick, but like, I don't know. I, I just look at it from watching the games that, you know. You're indifferent. Yeah. I just think that, you know, are they, I think they're not going to give this kid a chance to be the bell cow nor. And maybe my player evaluation was a little off thinking that he was better than what he really is. Yeah. I was definitely disappointed in his production in, in, in 2021. And yes, there's a lot of injury driven concerns there as well. Um, but you look at, you know, the explosiveness of this offense and, and I have to ask, you know, does, does anyone really need to be a bell cow in this backfield in order to produce fantasy numbers, right? Do, do they, they don't need the 25, 30 carries that Derrick Henry was getting because, you know, this team is always in the red zone. This team is always, uh, you know, past the 50, 50 yard line and, and they have a chance to score a lot more than teams that are running the ball 20, 30 times a game. There's more plays being ran, et cetera. So difference of opinions here. I, again, I, I, I draft him because I think that his potential and maybe I have just been led astray by the potential that I think he could become in this offense and I haven't quit him. Maybe I'm too stupid to quit, <laughs> but, but um, I think that he could, you know, return second round value of where he was being drafted in 2020 drafts. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, we shall see. Time will tell. Awesome. Um, Anna says curious about why um, Nelson is out on Henry. I, I just think that it's a, it's a workload situation where I, I think it's catching up to him and, you know, the, the foot injury, a lot of people can speculate that that's just a freak injury and and had nothing else to do with it. But I look at it as, you know, you got a plate and five screws in your foot. Um, I just don't don't think he's going to be the same. 
Um, and yeah, I, I'm just not interested in a guy that's not really going to catch passes. He's not really in, you know, he's off on third downs and passing down work. Um, so, you know, he's similar to like Antonio Gibson, like, you know, they, they rather have Hilliard in there and, you know, on passing down. So just not a, not a guy that really, you know, he's still going to go high in drafts this year. And I don't know. I just think that he might be damaged goods. Okay. I like it. You got, I got a couple more questions here before I, I, I wrap us up. I know it's getting late over there on the East coast, but how do you yourself personally get better as a fantasy player every year? We're all looking to improve. So how do you yourself look to improve in annually? That's actually a good question because I've had to, um, in the off season, I've had to check myself and, and have, you know, checks and balances a little bit, because what I found is with, besides being a fantasy player, I I'm also in the, you know, content industry. So I'm giving advice, uh, to subscribers. Um, and I feel like trying to make them better, um, at one point, if I'm not careful, I, I kind of could like become a little bit stale, uh, because all I'm focused on is trying to give people advice and have help people win their leagues. And then I'm not taking the time for myself for, to make sure that I'm sharp and that I haven't lost my edge. Refining so, the process. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I feel like, um, uh, it was probably, I don't know, three years ago, because uh, I'd been in the in the content uh, side of things um, for a little while now, and I I've, I kind of had to check myself because I felt like, you know, what's going on here? You know, I ended up having kind of a disappointing year. Um, I had gotten, you know, some things right, a lot of things wrong, and I I had to make sure that. I stuck with my process and I, and I kept adjusting and kept, um, you know, we all can learn something every day, you know, and, and I look at it as you can't be content with your prior success. Um, you, you have to continue to stay hungry. So I think once you rest on prior success and championships and, you know, uh, while it's great listening to the intro and, and you speak so highly of me and I, I appreciate that Billy. Um, you know, it, I actually try to tune it out a little bit when you started talking about it and like, Oh, you know, one of the best fantasy players in the world. And I, I actually try to tune that out because I don't want it to listen, especially us guys, everybody's got an ego, right. And, especially in men, we, we definitely have, uh, issues with that. And, you know, you don't want the ego getting too big. Um, and then you, you kind of, you know, forget about the process and, and the, the little things, um, to continue be, you know, being a good player. And then you just kind of, you know, you show up to a draft and you're like, Hey, I, I fucking won five championships, baby, you know, and I've won this much money. So, you know, respect the ground that I'm walking on. Once you start having that kind of attitude, then, you, you know, the game's kind of passed you by and, and you're going to, you're, you're going to end up losing more than winning. Yeah. I call that like a stagnant attitude. Right. And, and you think that what you're doing now, like you're just okay with the level of success that, and I'm not saying this is you at all. I'm just saying in general, like people who are just kind of okay at where they're at currently and don't feel like they need to adjust anything, right? I feel like that's when you start to uh, decline, right? So uh, I like hearing the fact that, I mean, I I, I like to, to pump you up here because I, you have had success. So, uh, you know, I look at it as a reflection process, right? And I like to do this as well every year. I take a look at players I got right, players I got wrong. And what did I miss? Why did I miss it? Right. Did I miss something in my own process that caused me 
to miss this player or be off on this player? And how do I refine that process? And how do I become better as one, an analyst and two, a player? So I, I full heartedly agree with you there. Um, and I, I, I love the process. I am always looking to get better. Um, and I think that you mentioned that you mentioned it, you said the word hungry, right? And you can't teach that to people. You either have it or you don't have it. So we can talk about hunger. We can talk about drive. We can talk about motivation throughout the show all we want, but you either have it or you don't have it. And we as analysts, we as players can, can, can talk to you about it all day long. But if you don't have that drive to succeed, if you don't have that hunger to be the best, then I'm going to be honest with you. You're going to fail in the high stakes community because every single person out there playing right now is that type of person. They are built that way. They're looking to get better daily. They're looking to refine their process daily. They are constantly looking and striving to be the best that they possibly can to make the most money. And so I want to thank you, Nelson, because your process is going to help players here. It helps me. It helps our listeners probably helps yourself talking about it as well to refine that process, to create that process and to just show players that the process is necessary. I put, typed it earlier, hashtag trust the process because the process is the most important aspect in fantasy football. I believe you yeah. mentioned earlier, you're right. You're wrong. Doesn't matter. The process is correct. That's what, that's what is ultimately our goal. Yeah, no, for, for sure. Because at, at the end of the day, if, if you just keep, you, you want to adjust, but you want to adjust the r right things. So if you go year in and year out and you say, okay, well, this year, this year was the year of the wide receiver, right? So if you drafted Cooper Cup in the fourth round and you took Debo Samuel and, Debo? you know, and you took Jalen Waddle um, in the later rounds, and you went running back heavy, you could have had, you know, monster teams. You know, if if you if you started your draft, Jonathan Taylor, Austin Eckler, and then you went, you know, wide receivers and you got Debo and 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 these guys, um, you were in great shape, you know. You you won a lot of leagues. Well, this year, you if you're gonna go in with that thought process and say, All right, I'm gonna find the next Debo and I'm gonna find the next Cooper Cup. And I'm going to find the next Jalen Waddle. And I'm going to repeat the same thing that, I, you know, happened last year. You know, that that's every year is different. And that's where you could go wrong um, and end up failing is always. And people say this all the time. Like I, I see it out on fantasy site, you know, for, for example. So like it. it there might not be a Debo Samuel. Who's this year's Cooper Cup? There is no freaking this year's Cooper Cup. Cooper Cup had a historic season. Not going to happen, you know. And and he was going in the fourth round. It for teams that drafted him, it was a it was like a free square. It was like a cheat code, uh, you know, this year because you you could have missed on some early picks, and he was that good for you, um, you know. Where Debo Samuel and and, you know, Jalen Waddle and even like to a lesser extent, Mike Williams, like where some of these guys went and they, you know, they carried you for the most part. You know, you, you can't you can't just look at it and try to pigeonhole, um, you know, certain questions and of like certain players like, you know, OK, who's this year's Debo and who's going to be this year's, you know, X player. So I, I think you know, new year, new adjustments. Um, like I don't even, I don't even know, like I got to get a few drafts under my belt to understand where players are going to go in, in drafts. And then that's going to give me kind of like a feeling, a uh, feel out process of how I'm going to want to draft this year. Like, absolutely. I, I know one of the questions we were talking about, um, uh, off here was like, okay, like how, what's my style of drafting? Well, my style of drafting is diverse. Like, like this year, for example, I would say that I, I could go two running backs to start and then go wide receivers. And it resulted in me, uh, ending up with Cooper cup and players like that. Um, but 
like the real you know draft strategy that I liked, the style that I liked this year was more of one running back between the first or second round. It didn't, back. it didn't matter. And then it was hammer wide receivers. And it was like four straight wide receivers after that. Yeah, anchor, um, hero, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Whatever, yeah, whatever you want to call it. It was one running back in the first two rounds. I was grabbing one of them. What whether it was Antonio Gibson or whether it was Najee Harris or whether it was, you know, uh, McCaffrey or Eckler, Dalvin Cook, whoever it was. It, it was one of those guys, and then it was just straight wide receivers. This year, who knows? Like, it just depends, like, the player flow. It depends ADP. It depends where guys are going to, you know, value players. Uh, that that could change for, for this year. And I think I have said this every single show since I've started doing this this um, this show for full time in fan uh, in FFWC. Um, I have said it time and time again. I'm gonna say it again. Be fluid, right? And 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 Nelson just 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 said it as well. Adjust. Look at what players are doing. You need to be fluid in drafts and especially in early drafts when ADP is is being settled, especially as players are moving drastically up and down boards be fluid be able to adjust on the fly that's how you're going to succeed in this game yep well nelson i want to say thank you again for joining us i appreciate you taking the time out of your uh week day and hopping on to grind time uh powered by full-time fantasy and the ffwc i threw it up on the board earlier there we have uh, uh early bird discounts right now so 1600 dollars for the uh world championship entry right now normally priced at 1795 the 22 online championship entry is discounted to 325 normally priced at 349 again this is um one of the best payouts for in-league prizes that you can get uh inside those world championships uh, dominator best record and most points pays out ten thousand dollars to that league dominator champion so um i took one home this this year as well with with dave my draft partner so um it is um definitely a nice feeling to cash in 10 grand inside your league so head on over to i'll put i'll drop the link inside the show notes here after the show is over so people can click on the link and go on over um, but nelson thanks for joining us buddy um why don't you tell people where to find you twitter tag everything um and they can follow you on twitter yeah, it's um, it's the the franchise dash. Um, it's it's actually the underscore franchise twelve uh, on Twitter, and then I'm also you know uh, going to be returning to FTN Fantasy, uh, so I'll be there and still have the high stakes package uh, available. Uh, so be sure to check that out also this season. Well, Nelson, I appreciate you coming on again. Thank you. And for all those who tuned in and chimed in inside the show, I appreciate, um, appreciate your comments and appreciate your participation. And we will see you all back here next week on Grand Time. Have a good night.